Welcome back. We're very excited to have our last presentation today on this channel. Of course, there's the ending keynotes, which will be happening in an hour. But before that, we have one last presentation to give you on the beginner friendly spring channel. I've been with you all day, Bob Brindley here. I've got Lal and Bryant and uh, Mike and all the other crew, which has been great uh, working behind the scenes. So thank you, gentlemen, for all your professionalism and help. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our next presenter for the day. Explain it to me like I'm five, the OAuth and Open ID presentation by, by Daniel Makusa. Take it away, Daniel. Thanks, Bob. All right, I'm gonna just start sharing my slides here. Great, so uh, thanks everybody for joining today. Uh, we're gonna talk about Open, uh, OpenID Connect and OAuth 2. Uh, I am Dana Makusa and I work for VMware on the Tansy team. Uh, I work in our support department and this talk kind of got spawned out of uh, just a series of of issues that I've seen with customers and with you know people that are asking questions about you know OAuth two and OpenID Connect, and so you know I put this talk together to try to break things down and just explain things in the simplest possible light, um, just to set expectations. Uh, I don't know that I could actually teach this to a five year old, but uh, we'll try to keep it as simple as possible and uh, make it so that uh, it's something you can walk away and be confident in. So our agenda today is pretty straightforward. Uh, we're gonna talk about when and why. Uh, you gotta know when uh, and why you'd wanna use this stuff. Uh, after that, we'll cover the concepts um, so that you're familiar with the terminology. Um, these are based around specs. So um, understanding that the concepts and the terminology is really important You know, when you ask questions or when you communicate with other professionals about this type of thing. And then uh, because we're at Spring 1, we'll finish up with showing how you can use Spring Security to protect your apps. So reasons to use uh, OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. Uh, everyone's probably built an application before and they've come to the point where they realize I've got some user specific information and I need to make a user. I need to store this information and it has to be tied to that user. That's a very common scenario. Um, Spring Security has some great stuff there to make it easy you know, to store your users in a database or an LDAP, uh, but uh, invariably, that ends up putting a lot of extra work on you. Um, so if you're building your own, you know, kind of login solution here, um, you know, you're gonna need to store credentials, you're gonna have to manage, you know, a login flow, you're gonna have a login screen, you know, maybe you have to add some capture to that, um, you know, password requirements, password lockout, uh, you know, and then, you know, your boss is gonna come along and want you to integrate with LDAP or SAML, um, add two-factor auth, you know, any number of, of additional things. That's all work that, that you're gonna have to do. Um, you know, not to mention, you know, at some point you're gonna be working on your next application and you're gonna have to do all this stuff over again. And so, uh, one of the nice things about OpenID Connect, so this is kind of a big, you know, signal as to when you would use it, you know, is once you start to see, you know, this become a burden, uh, you know, when you don't want to do that work, when, um, you know, you have multiple applications and you want to try to share that work across them, you know, OpenID uh, Connect and OAuth 2 can, can come in and save uh, you a lot of time. And so, you know, with OpenID Connect and, and OAuth 2, you have what's called a provider, and we'll talk about that later. And uh, the provider is, is some third party that's essentially going to manage all this for you. They're going to store your users. They're going to manage all the login flows and, and make sure things are nice and secure uh, and, you know, implement two-factor auth and all that stuff. So you, you just get it all for free. Uh, not to mention on top of that, you'll get, you know, the, the single sign-on. You can use this across multiple applications. So that's a, a big reason why you might, uh, you know, want to take a look at OAuth 2. Uh, or if you're starting to see these pain points, that's kind of when you'd want to. Uh, reach for this type of solution. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, single sign-on, a single sign-off is big. Um, you know, it, if you're, you know, working for a company that's providing, you know, public facing, you know, our consumer services, you might integrate with, you know, one of the big cloud companies, you know, like Google or GitHub or Facebook, mm -hmm. um, you know, those can help get to you a, you know, kind of larger user base, um, you know, more quickly. Um, if you are working on kind of, you know, internal applications, you know, you might be looking at integrating with some sort of 
you know, corporate login uh, like Okta or Auth0. Um, you know, these are the systems that kind of give, you know, employees that, that single page to go to where they can log into you know, different applications. And so, you know, whenever you're, you're tasked with integrating something like that, you know, you're talking about OpenID Connect and OAuth2. Uh, kind of the flip side of that is if you want to access um, cloud APIs, uh, you know, these would be things like, uh, you know, Google APIs, you know, for sending email or um, for, you know, GitHub APIs to, to access an org or, um, you know, Facebook to, to make some posts or something on behalf of a user. You know, those are all things that, that OAuth2, you know, is built for as well. So, you know, if you have a project that's trying to integrate with these, you know, other uh, third-party APIs, you're more than likely going to have to, to reach for OAuth. And the last one would be if you want to create your own cloud APIs. Um, you know, everyone's kind of doing it these days. There's lots of them out there, and it's it's created this kind of explosion of, of awesome things that we can do in our applications, you know, by integrating with other people's APIs. And so if you want to, to develop your own and integrate your own or, or create your own and expose that to the world, um, you know, OpenID Connect and, and OAuth2 are, are kind of the way to do that. Um, they do it in a secure way and it's a stand, they're all based on standards. And so it's very easy for other people to, to integrate with your services. So those are some of the, the kind of general scenarios where you'd want to use uh, OAuth2 and OpenID Connect. Um, you know, like I said, if you're seeing those, you know, pop up or if your boss is asking for those types of things, those are signs that, that you might need to use that. Um, there's nothing to worry about, you know, if you have to reach for OAuth2 or OpenID Connect, you know, it might seem a little bit scary, but it's really not. Um, you know, there are some basic concepts that you have to know. We're going to cover those next. And I think once you understand the basic concepts and terminology, you know, you'll be able to, um, you know, communicate with other professionals about, you know, your OAuth2 integrations. And, you know, you'll be able to follow, you know, third-party documentation for, you know, how to integrate or, you know, Spring Security documentation pretty easily as well. So kind of the core concept uh, that you have to understand, and this is not just with OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, um, it's just in general, you know, with securing your apps, you're gonna have two terms that you need to know. You know, there's authentication and authorization. And, um, you know, these are just kind of fundamental to the process. And so, you know, with authentication, um, you're trying to, to answer the question, who is somebody? You know, who is this user or who am I? And you have to look at it from the perspective of your application or from your server. Um, you know, they basically have stranger danger. They don't really know who you are. There's no way for them to know that unless you prove your identity to them. And so authentication is the process of how you go about proving that you know, to the application or, your, or the server. Um, you know, a real simple way of, of, of explaining that, you know, if you want to go out to the bar, uh, you know, you have to be 21 to get in, at least here in the States. So you show your ID that proves, you know, to the bouncer at the door, you know, who you are and how old you are. Um, authorization is the kind of flip side to it. So once you've proven who you are, uh, you need to prove uh, or you need to figure out, you know, what a particular user can do. And so your application is going to go through this authorization process, which is essentially figuring out what a specific user is allowed to do in, in terms of that application. So, um, you know, an, an easy way to think about that is it's, it's kind of like a job title. You know, if you are uh, a teacher at a school, uh, you know, you might be able to look at your, um, you know, your students' records, you know, to, to grade their tests or, or something like that. But if you're a principal, you know, at the school, you know, well, then you can see more. You can see probably all the students in the school. Um, you know, you have a larger access because of what your job title is. And so those could be different, um, you know, authorization levels that, that you might have, you know, depending on, you know, who you are, what you do. Next on the list, um, the OAuth 2 spec defines uh, these four particular rules here, and they're uh, just kind of 
they're really basic terms, but they have a, a specific way that the spec talks about them. And so if you are, you know, reading documentation, you know, reading the spec even, um, you know, or trying to figure out how to integrate, um, you know, your, your applications, you know, with OAuth 2, you're going to come across these terms and it's important to understand what they mean. Um, you know, they're not difficult, but, um, you know, you just have to understand the particular, you know, jargon that they're using so that you can, you know, follow along with things. And so you have, you know, a resource owner, a resource server, uh, and the two of these together kind of imply that there's a resource as well. Uh, but uh, the spec talks about the owner, the server, uh, an authorization server, and uh, which is also sometimes called a provider, uh, and you have the client or application as well. And uh, probably the easiest way to explain these is just to kind of go through a basic example, uh, you know, kind of a real world example of, of, of you know, something that you might do that, that would encounter these different actors. Um, so, you know, you have your resource owner, uh, which is obviously a person who owns a resource. So in our example, we'll say that we have a jacket uh, and someone's going to own that jacket. So we'll say it's me and, and I am the resource owner because I own that jacket and the jacket is the resource. Um, we then want to, I want to store my, my jacket in the locker. You know, I don't want to carry it around with me. Um, so I put my jacket in the locker and the locker now becomes the resource server. The resource server is storing my resource for me uh, on my behalf. Uh, I don't own the resource server. I don't own the locker, but it's just holding on to my things for me. Uh, the next concept is the authorization server. So I need something to protect my jacket. And in this case, I'm going to put a lock on the, the locker that's going to keep my jacket nice and safe. And that is essentially the authorization server. It uh, you know, handles the security aspects of things. It handles you know, making sure I'm the one that's able to access my jacket or potentially someone that I give uh, the authority to go and you know, get my jacket for me. And then the last one is the client or the application. And this could be, you know, my friend, perhaps, you know, I don't want to go and get my coat. So I asked my friend to do it. Maybe he's passing by the locker on his way home. And so my friend in this case would be the client or the application because he's, he's acting on my behalf. He's acting on the resource owner's behalf. And that's, you know, kind of, if you're, if you're developing an application, you know, your application is, it tends to be the client. It's doing something on a user's behalf. So another uh, concept that you're going to hear about a lot, you know, with OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect are tokens. And, you know, there's various different types of tokens that you might hear about. You know, we'll kind of talk about those here in a second. They're, they're really pretty straightforward. Um, so there's not, not a lot to be concerned with. Um, the two primary with token types that you're going to see are access tokens and refresh tokens. And um, there are different types of, of access tokens. You might hear about a bearer token. You might hear about a JWT or JWT token. You might hear about opaque tokens. Those are really just kind of implementation details, um, you know, in different, uh, different ways to uh, uh, present an access token. But essentially, an access token is just something that, that you can present um, to a uh, resource server. So, you know, in the, in the previous example, my locker, you know, I could present the token and then that would allow me to get access to whatever the resource server has uh, that, that I'd like to get access to. Um, if you've been to a carnival before, um, the access token is very similar to a carnival ticket. You know, you, you go to the carnival, they have all these, these rides that you might want to get on. And so you buy these little paper tickets. And, uh, you know, the carnival ticket is kind of like your access token. You can present it to someone, they'll let you on the ride. Uh, you can go enjoy the ride and then the token expires and it's gone. Um, important thing to remember, and this is where the, the, the bearer token concept comes in. Uh, whoever has that token owns that token. Uh, so, you know, it, it could be re it could be a token to access my stuff. But if uh, you know if somebody else gets that token, they they can now access my stuff. It's just like a carnival ticket. You know, it's just this little uh, you know paper ticket. You know, possession of that ticket is the law. Whoever has that owns it. Uh, refresh tokens are very similar. Uh, they're usually represented in a similar format to access tokens. So you, you'd have a, a JWT token, um, and Essentially, this, this is a way that you can get more access tokens. So if access tokens are typically short-lived and, and the refresh token just allows you to go and get uh, more access tokens. So 
if you were at a carnival, you know, the refresh token would be similar to your parents' credit card. Uh, you could just go take your credit card and get some more tokens uh, or get some more carnival tickets, you know, i.e. more tokens. The next, uh, you know, kind of concept to cover are scopes. Um, scopes are pretty straightforward. It's uh, just kind of a fancy way of, of saying it's, you know, a, a permission or something that you can do. Um, if you are familiar with Spring Security, Spring Security has these concept of roles. You know, a scope maps essentially directly into this concept of a role in Spring Security. Um, you know, so uh, kind of like I mentioned before, um, you know, a scope is, is really, it's like a job title. Um, you know, if, if you are a principal or a teacher, you know, that would entitle you to a specific, you know, uh, scope or possibly set of scopes that, that allow you to do the things that you need. Um, they, um, you know, there's some examples here on the left, uh, you know, scopes can really be anything that you want. Um, you know, it, it seems silly to say that, you know, a scope might be brains.eat or wishes.grant, but it's, you know, the OAuth2 spec is, is very general and it's meant to service, you know, any number of applications and, you know, whatever they possibly want to do. So, um, you know, the scope is, is just this opaque thing that you can kind of make up and your applications actually define what it does. Um, so, you know, if I'm writing a blog application, you know, blog.write has meaning to me, uh, and that's what's important. Uh, understanding how scopes applied is, is important because invariably you'll be, uh, you know, trying to test an application and, uh, you know, the right scope won't be getting applied and it won't work. And so you kind of have to understand how they're applied so that you can go about, you know, reasoning through and debugging, you know, what's happening. Um, so, you know, scopes are essentially, you know, th there can be many scopes that are eligible for a particular user in a particular interaction. And what's going to happen is you'll end up with some intersection of all the possible scopes. And what's what's left in that intersection is what gets applied. Um, so, you know, that might seem a little confusing, but I'll walk through this example and I think it'll be pretty, uh, pretty easy to see how it works. So um, the, the different OAuth2 roles that we discussed earlier uh, have different scopes applied to them. So my client and my appli or, or application itself has scopes applied to it. So let's say, you know, I have a client app. It has, you know, serve.lunch and eat.lunch. Um, those are two scopes applied to my client. Now, the user, it's, the user itself that's stored in the authorization server, the user is going to have his or her own scopes as well. So they could potentially have cook.lunch and eat.lunch. And then everybody's probably seen, you know, the, the login form, you know, that's the kind of the hallmark of, of OAuth. Uh, you know, if you're logging in, you know, to Facebook or something or using an app that logs into Facebook, you know, you get the form, you know, can this app, uh, you know, access your feed on behalf of, of, of you or uh, can it make a post for you or something like that? Um, you know, so this login form is kind of another potential spot, you know, where the scopes can be restricted. And so what you end up with is uh, a resulting set of of the the of all of these scopes or i'm sorry of all of these different roles so if we can see in the example all three of these have eat.lunch so the only scope that's going to get applied uh, after the user log is in is eat.lunch and if at any point one of those three uh, did not have eat.lunch then nothing would get applied so if the user is logging in and they uncheck the box and say, you know what, I don't want to allow uh, this application to, to eat my lunch. Uh, I'm going to uncheck this box. Then the resulting set would be no scopes at all. Um, that may or may not break your application entirely. If your application depends on, on having that scope, then it would. Uh, or possibly your application will adapt and, and, and just not do certain things because of that. Uh, that's really an implementation deal to help up to your application. Uh, but it's important just to see that, you know, these, these scopes can be restricted in different ways and you have to have the scope in every place uh, or you're not going to end up having access to it uh, in your application. Uh, grant types. Uh, this is kind of the point where I, I typically see people's eyes start to gloss over a little bit uh, when you talk about grant types. There's a number of them. Uh, some of them are more important than others. Some of them are more complicated than others. And so, um, you know, it's kind of just important to put things in perspective. Um, 
the ones that I have listed here are very common ones that you'll see. Um, and from left to right, probably the most common. So client credentials is one that you will use uh, fairly frequently. Um, it's your, your standard service to service communication. So this is kind of, uh, you know, backend processes, backups, things like that can use client credentials. Um, the next one and the one that you'll see very often as well as authorization code. And this is your, your, your standard browser based, um, you know, user login form, um, you know, something like login as Facebook or login as your Google user, you know, it's using the authorization code flow. Uh, device code is another one that's that is starting to pop up more and more, and it's used with devices that have limited limited input capabilities. So that would be like your Roku or your TV. Uh, you know, when you go to log in to to Hulu or Netflix or something, instead of typing out your you know 50 character password and username, uh, it will you know pop up this URL that says go here and then enter the code that you see, and that's that's essentially your device code flow. Uh, refresh is uh, something that works in tandem with the authorization code flow. Um, essentially, you know, your short-lived access token is going to expire, and you don't want the user to have to go through the authorization code flow every, you know, two or three minutes when that expires. So there's this refresh flow that uh, utilizes the refresh token we previously talked about to obtain more access tokens without having to bother the user every every two or three minutes. The last two listed here, password and implicit, uh, these are less secure options. And so they're really not recommended, uh, especially if you're building new apps at this point. We'll touch on them briefly, uh, but um, uh, again, they're really not something that you should use unless you absolutely have to, or you're working with some sort of legacy uh, application. And again, don't panic. Um, you know, these might seem complicated, but they're really not. And we'll kind of walk through uh, them here in a second. And I hope that you'll see that it's, it's really pretty manageable. All right, so client credentials grant, uh, like I mentioned, this one's pretty common. Uh, it's, it's also the simplest flow. Uh, just conceptually, it's very basic. Um, and it works very similar to just how a traditional username password login would work. The difference is that with a client credentials grant, the client is trusted. So the client has to be um, trusted to protect uh, this the client's credentials. Um, if you can't trust the client, uh, like if you have a browser-based, you know, single-page app, or if you have a, um, a mobile app or something that could be, you know, deconstructed and in the these could be leaked, then uh, you, know, you, you definitely can't use this flow. Um, so this is like your secure server environment, you know, machine to machine communication. And the way that it works, each client or application has its own ID and secret. It presents those to get an access token. It uses the access token to get what it wants. When the access token expires, it just gets another access token with its ID and secret and pr proceeds on like that until it's done doing whatever it needs to do. Um, Back to our previous analogy with the jacket and the locker, uh, the way client credentials would work. Uh, if uh, I'm a user and I forgot my key, uh, the client, uh, so we'll say the janitor in this case, has keys that uh, the janitor could use and could open the lock, uh, our authorization server, and retrieve my coat for me. And because you know the, jan the janitor has you know keys, has his own unique keys for him for him or her, um, you know is able to get in and just open the locker and obtain my jacket. And the important thing to, to note here about this is that, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily, the janitor doesn't have to necessarily notify me of what's happening. Um, you know, if it was an untrustworthy janitor, you know, he or she could go in and just take my coat, maybe wear it for the day and put it back at the end of the day. But, um, you know, again, the client credentials grants are more of a trusted mechanism. And so, you know, um, you wouldn't hand these out to just anybody. Uh, password, uh, which I mentioned before, is very similar to uh, client credentials. It's just, uh, and the reason it's insecure is because you now have a third actor that's involved. You have the actual end user. And instead of a secure client that we trust presenting uh, an ID and secret to the, to the uh, authorization provider, we now have a user who's talking to a client. The user is giving us their very personal private password and and where the client is taking that and obtaining a token using that user's you know, personal private password. And so 
you know, the client in this case has to be uh, trusted absolutely, because if the client does anything, you know, malicious or or wrong, you know, they could steal that user's credentials and and go do you know literally whatever they want with them, and so you know, the password flow is not recommended. Um, where you'll sometimes see this is with like a CLI. Um, and you know there can still be like the occasional use case where it might make sense, but uh, you really have to make sure that your users trust that client to be doing the right thing. Um, to our analogy, uh, the client flow would be like if you gave your password, you know, your your combo for your locker to your friend and said, "Hey, can you get my code for me?" You know, your friend has your actual password for the you know the lock. They can open it up, get your code, and bring it to you. So uh, authorization code flow, um, this is the one that you, you know, if you really want to understand OAuth, this is where, like, definitely where to spend your time because you're going to use this a lot. And it's a little more complicated, but it's it's not, um, you know, it's, 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 it's something that you can understand if you, if you walk through it a couple of times. So, you know, it's important to realize it's, it's confidential, it's secure, and it's browser-based. Uh, so when you have your non-browser based workflows like mobile and CLI apps, you can still use it, but because it's browser based, it's, it's a, it can occasionally be a little bit awkward. Um, the whole flow works by making a lot of uh, HTTP redirects. Uh, that's important to realize because if you're, if you're debugging it, um, you know, you want to be able to watch those, you know, using your browser. Uh, there's also a back channel request that it makes. You know, a back channel request is just, um, you know, the, the, your client talking directly to the authorization provider. It's back channel because it's not involving the user. Um, and in this, in this flow, users will typically have to approve the, the scopes or permissions that are going to be granted to the client or application. Um, it's not always the case. Um, but in most cases, the user will get that option, uh, like we talked about previously in the uh, applying scope section. Um, there's kind of an extension to the authorization code flow that, that incorporates what they call PKCE, or uh, proof key for code exchange. And this is a, 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 an additional security mechanism that you can use with untrusted clients. So like your single page apps or your mobile apps. Uh, where the client will generate a secret, and it uses this uh, this cryptographically generated secret um, to kind of enhance the flow of of things. I'm not going to go into the details of it here because it is a little bit more complicated, uh, but it's worth knowing if you have one of those cases where you're you're doing a single page app uh, or a mobile app. Um, and the implicit flow that I mentioned a couple slides back is very similar to the authorization code flow. Um, it's, it's, again, not really recommended to be, using, to be used. It was kind of the previous go-to for untrusted clients and single page apps, but, but it has some inherent weaknesses in the way that it works. And I'll, I'll try to call that out in the example because I think it's, it's more clear in the, the example that I have for you. So if we go back to our analogy, you know, we have our jacket, it's in the locker, and we want to lend our jacket to our friend. If we're using uh, an authorization code flow to do that, essentially what we're going to do is our friend is going to go to the locker. Um, the locker is going to be, you know, super high tech, so it's going to call us. Uh, and by us, I mean it's going to call the resource owner, the person who owns the jacket. And that would be, you know, similar to the redirect. And at this point, you know, we're talking directly to the authorization provider. So we know that that's secure and we know, you know, we trust that provider. And we enter our credentials directly to that. So, you know, I would, uh, you know, unlock my lock and essentially confirm access for my friend. Um, the uh, authorization provider or the lock would then send my friend a temporary code called an auth code that they could use to obtain an access token and then open my lock, uh, open the lock and get access to, to the jacket. Um, the, uh, the thing I mentioned about the implicit flow and why it's secure is because um, there's no client credentials here. So there's no way for the client to identify itself um, to the authorization provider. So after I log in, um, in the implicit flow, the authorization provider is going to send directly back an access token. And it just kind of hopes and prays that that access token gets back to the right person. Uh, if the wrong person intercepts that access token, they can go take it and do whatever they want with it. And so 
that's kind of why we don't recommend implicit anymore. And and the uh, using the uh, authorization code flow with PKCE adds some additional cryptographic material that gets transferred as part of the request, and it kind of helps lock that down, and it helps guarantee that the uh, authorization provider is sending the access token back to the person uh, or to the client that it expects. So to this point, we've talked a lot about OAuth 2, and um, now we're going to kind of switch gears just a little bit and talk about OpenID Connect. And it's not a terribly uh, different switch because OpenID Connect is really just an extension to OAuth 2. Um, if you're thinking about the, the two terms, the two security terms we discussed initially, uh, authorization and authentication, um, OAuth 2 is, is, is firmly focused on authorization. So it's, it's really focused on discussing or on determining what a person can do, not necessarily who a person is. And so OpenID Connect is an additional standard that extends OAuth 2 to implement authentication. Uh, or identity. So it's its focus is proving who someone is, not what they can do. And so the two pair together very nicely because one provides your authentication and one provides your authorization. Um, OpenID Connect uh, introduces a whole bunch of things that we'll just touch on really quick. Uh, you know, the JSON Web Token Standard, um, it introduces this concept of an ID token, which is uh, similar to an access token, but it, it has a different purpose. It's, its purpose is identifying who a person is, um, not, not what that person can do. Um, it also um, has some standard scopes and some standard endpoints, implements some things like discovery and single logout, um, just to make kind of life easier for everyone. Um, but, you know, it's just important to realize that it's it's really not that different. You still get all the OAuth 2 goodness. And a lot of times, uh, you know, when people are talking about OAuth 2 or, or OpenID Connect, they're almost talking about the same thing. So, you know, it, it's important to be specific about what you're talking about if you're, you know, communicating to someone about this stuff. But you do have to realize that some people will interchange these concepts a little bit um, in, in conversation. So OpenID Connect has an authorization code flow as well. Um, just like OAuth2's authorization code flow, it's confidential, secure, and browser-based. It is uh, very similar um, in, in all aspects except for a couple high-level differences. So um, the purpose of it is not to uh, determine what someone can do, it's to do single sign-on. So it's going to authenticate the person and determine who they are. And instead of getting an access token back that I can use to go make requests on behalf of a user, what I'm getting back is an ID token that tells me who that user is. And so um, it's very firmly focused on doing login. Um, so after I complete this flow, I know who somebody is and, and they're successfully logged into my app. Um, there's also a hybrid flow uh, because the two pair together so nicely, uh, you're probably going to want to do both. And so the hybrid flow of this will end up resulting in kind of one pass through, but you get both an ID token and an access token. And just to, to give an analogy of, of how this works, if you're going to uh, say a, a swimming pool and it's a members only swimming pool, you're going to get to the pool and the gate attendant's going to send you off to the ticket booth. So that's kind of your initial redirect. Uh, the ticket booth would be your authorization server. Uh, they're going to validate who you are. So you'd present your ID and that's, you know, kind of akin to logging in. And after that, you're going to get, a, uh, say, a wristband maybe, uh, and that would be like your ID token. So the authorization server, uh, our ticket booth is going to give us the wristband. And then we can take that back to the, to the gate and show it to the gate attendant and they'll know who we are and then we can enter the pool. So it's a lot to, to kind of go through in concepts, but uh, you know, I hope that was a, a nice breakdown um, so that uh, you can kind of understand it. We're gonna run through real quick on how to protect our apps. Uh, and like I said, because this is spring one, we're gonna talk about spring security. The first thing to realize with spring security is that there are two, ver two variants of OAuth support out there. Um, there is spring securities uh, built-in OAuth support, and then there's a separate project called Spring Security OAuth. And uh, the general advice at this point is if you're uh, building a new app, you definitely want to use Spring Security's built-in OAuth support. Um, the older project, Spring Security OAuth, is kind of deprecated. Um, it's uh, it's still there if you if you have apps using it, you can keep using it, but um, you know it's not something you want to build something new based on. 
And uh, version-wise, Spring, Secur Spring Security's built-in support uh, is available in 5.2 and up. And um, Spring Security's built-in support actually is, is a little more encompassing. It has some more features and stuff uh, than uh, Spring Security OAuth project. There's a very nice comparison comparison of the two on the wiki. So if you're if you're curious, you can reference that. Um, as far as the integrations that are supported, there's really three types. You can do login, uh, which is like your single sign-on. You can do client, which would be if you're accessing some OAuth2 protected resources. And you can do a resource server, which is if you're building your own uh, API uh, that you want other people to be able to access using OAuth2. So, the process for all these is very simple and uh, it's entirely uh, on this slide. So it's very uh, straightforward to get this going. This is an example of how you would do single login uh, with Spring Security. And if you click the first link, it'll take you to start.spring.io, which is a fantastic place to create a new uh, app. You're gonna add uh, three starters, the ones that are listed there, Spring Security, OAuth2 Client, and Spring Web Starters. Um, after that, you have to go to your OAuth2 provider and set up an OAuth2 client. That's going to vary based on your provider. Um, you know, you can usually uh, find instructions for that in your provider's documentation. Uh, you know, they'll walk you through how to set that up. The key is that your provider is going to ask, ask you for a redirect URL. And Spring Security uses a convention to define how that resource a redirect URL will be structured. So it's going to be the base URL for your application. Uh, slash login, slash OAuth2, slash code, slash registration ID. And the registration ID is just uh, something that you make up, whatever you want to call your provider. Uh, you could call it Google, you could call it uh, GitHub or whatever. Um, it, uh, it, you can just totally make it up, but it just has to be consistently referenced in the next step. So in your application.properties or application.yaml, uh, you're going to define these three properties, which will register your uh, OAuth2 provider and the registration ID here just has to match the one from your redirect URL and everything will be good. Um, client ID and client secret are given to you by your OAuth2 provider. So you'll just copy and paste those. Uh, just be careful because oftentimes OAuth providers will only display those once. So if you click off the page and it goes away, you probably can't get it back again. The issuer URI is a uh, URL that's specific to your provider and will essentially point you to the discovery endpoints um, for your provider. Uh, that is something you would just look up in the documentation for your provider. Beyond that, you're just gonna add your controllers, your endpoints, and start your application. And at that point, if you go to any of your controllers or endpoints, um, Spring Security will kick in. It's going to redirect you to your OAuth provider. You'll get that familiar login screen, and it's going to um, uh, log you into your application. And what happens at the end of the flow, after you're done talking to your provider, you get redirected back to that redirect URL that you specified. So if you go through this example, uh, a fun thing to do is pop open your browser's dev tools, watch the network tab, and you can see those redirects happening in the background. The uh, Spring Security Client integration is pretty straightforward as well. Uh, this builds upon the previous example. So step one here would just be enable login support like normal. Um, and then you're gonna add a couple, a couple additional dependencies here. We're adding these because uh, we want to use the, um, the web, uh, web client support. And if you wanted to use REST template, you, you certainly could. Uh, you just wouldn't add, you wouldn't need to add these dependencies. Then we're going to um, uh, you do our typical Spring Security uh, configuration where we extend the Web Security Configure Adapter and um, call http.oat2client. And we're just going to use default values for the configuration. Um, then we create a web client bean. The details of that are at the link here. Uh, and we create these two other beans that are kind of plumbing used by Spring Security um, to manage uh, your web client sessions. And then we in inject our web client into the classes wherever it's needed. So you can inject it into services or controllers, however you, you know, want to make use of it. And you can make your you know, web client requests to you know, whatever services uh, are protected by, by OAuth2. And that's it. It's, it's very straightforward. Um, 
I think uh, th there's a sample here. This takes you to the, the GitHub page for Spring Security. Uh, so if you want to just run something that's pre-made, but uh, you should should be able to just click through, uh, follow through these steps and, and and get your integration set up for your app as well. The last um, you know type of integration that Spring Security has is for resource servers. And again, that's if you just want to expose your own API. Um, you know, perhaps you, you have your own, uh, your company's API that uh, you want others to be able to use. Um, it's uh, also pretty straightforward. Um, and you would just start with uh, the Spring Initializer again. Um, the uh, set of starters is, is very comparable. The difference here is we're gonna use OAuth2 resource server instead of the OAuth2 client. Uh, and we also don't have as many uh, application dot properties that we have to set. In this case, there's just one. And what this does is it points to the um, set of JSON web keys that um, Spring Security will use to validate the web tokens. And that is kind of some implementation detail um, that you don't really have to worry about to integrate. You would just need to find that endpoint. It's again specific to your OAuth two provider, so you could uh, you know check your OAuth two provider's documentation or, or open a support ticket with them and ask, you know, what, what that URI would be. Um, and then uh, we're going to do our, you know, typical Spring Security config, extend web security adapter. Uh, we're going to tell it to enable the OAuth 2 resource server. And we're going to tell it that we're using JSON web tokens. Uh, you could op optionally use opaque tokens if you wanted. Uh, but in this case, we're just going to use JSON web tokens. And then you would go about defining uh, your roles. You know, so this is your, you know, typically what you would do with Spring Security. You know, you could use ant matchers or you could use annotations, uh, however you prefer to do it. And you just uh, essentially tell it that you know, I want uh, scope underscore, you know, whatever to be required. You know, so in this example, it's message under uh, colon read, but it could be you know blog dot write. It could be. Uh, you know, wishes.grant, you know, whatever, you know, makes sense for your API. And then Spring Security will enforce that for you. Um, you need to add your controllers and endpoints, obviously, uh, and then start your application. And at this point, you'll have a, you know, a functional application that's protected by, um, by Spring Security. Uh, the one thing to mention about this, you know, particular setup that might throw people, if you go to access this application after you run it, it's not going to redirect you to a login page um, because that's not really what it, what the purpose of it is. Um, you know, the resource server is is anticipating a um, a uh, a client talking to it, and so the client would typically forward um, the authorization header. It would forward your access token directly to it, and so there wouldn't be that you know that typical authorization flow that you see. Uh, it's just expecting that uh, the, the token to be provided. And so if you if you just go to it, you'll probably get a 401. Um, but you know the way that you would test this would be like with curl and you could set the header that uh, passes a, a valid token along and then you could access your API. So things uh, can and will invariably go wrong. Um, here's a couple quick tips for you know how you would debug you know Spring Security and and OAuth two integration. Um, you know first one's pretty pretty straightforward. You you just set the log level of Spring Security to debug. Spring Security is just is awesome in its logging. It gives you lots of of really helpful information to understand the flow and what's happening. You know where things might potentially be getting uh, hung up. Uh, you can also add, you know, the debug flag or set debug to true. Uh, that will give you just, you know, a whole slew of information from Spring Boot about the state of things. You know, you can see how, how uh, you know, beans are initialized and all that. Um, the Spring Boot actuators, you know, slash beans and config prop endpoints can be useful as well. You know, again, they dump kind of information about the state of your app and how the things are configured how things are configured, you know, so that you can make sure it's, uh, you know, configured the way that you anticipate. And then lastly, uh, the browser dev tools, uh, your network tab is invaluable. Um, you, you know, there's a lot of uh, redirects that are typically happening, you know, for these flows. And so it's important to be able to see what happened. Um, this is an example here, uh, you know, just from, from a demo app. You know, if you're going to the slash foo endpoint, you can see that, uh, you know, Spring Security is doing a couple of redirects. We're going to, you know, the, uh, the authorization provider that I used here, which was Microsoft uh, Active Directory. And then, um, you know, we're getting redirected back to our application. And then finally, we actually get to see our foo endpoint. 
And so, you know, if something's going wrong, you might see, you know, there's a, a, a 400 uh, type error, or you might see a 500 error, or something like that. And, you know, just understanding which point of the flow breaks down and, and, and what happened, you know, will allow you to kind of know where, where to go next to debug the type of thing. So in closing, um, if you haven't seen the site, Have I Been Pwned, it's pretty fun to take a look at. They track all of the many compromised password lists that are out there. Um, there, as I looked at this the, yesterday, there were 478 sites that had their password lists compromised. It was over 10 billion passwords um, and uh, kind of growing fast. So it's a list your company doesn't want to be on. Um, and that's just kind of a, a, a hopefully final uh, last reason why I, I hope you'll want to take a look at OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. Um, you know, let somebody else manage that stuff for you and, and just avoid the pitfalls and risks of it. I've got some resources here and I will um, post these slides and, and I can share these resources as well on Slack. Uh, so don't worry about copying all these down, but there's a couple nice ones. Um, the first link, uh, OAuth 2 reference has uh, just some good general documentation. OAuth 2 Playground is very nice for just stepping through the flows. Uh, it'll let you do that in your browser and you can see what's happening and what information gets shared. Uh, the JWT token de decoder will allow you to view the token and see what's in it. And then obviously you've got your Spring Security Docs and a couple uh, open, source, uh, open source authorization servers that you can run locally for your development work. And that's it. Normally I would take questions, but uh, we can't do that through this forum. So uh, please join me on Slack and uh, I will answer as many questions as I can. If you want to just uh, uh, tag me on Slack, you can at mention me. I think uh, my name is uh, D Makusa on Slack. So thank you. All right, thank you, Daniel. That was great. Uh, so much great information today from all of our presenters. And uh, thank you, Daniel, for walking us through that. Uh, we had a great day on this track. We still have one more amazing hour left. There's just enough time for you to go freshen up and get back for our closing keynote. We have a lot of great presenters coming up. Uh, Madura Bave, one of my favorites, Sebastian Deleuze, Oleg Sarkovsky, he's great. I just had him on a show last week and just so much great um, knowledge to share with you. And of course, I don't know if you see, they have uh, Colonel Jennifer uh, Krolikowski from Space Force. So uh, just lots of in-depth stuff happening with uh, all, of, all of our customers and people out there. So tune into that and then tune in again tomorrow. Same time, we'll see you after the keynote. I'll be here bright and early, ready for you. And uh, again, thank you to the team, the production team on the back end, Bryant, Lowell, Mike, anybody else I've forgotten. Have a great evening and enjoy the last hour of the keynotes. <laughs>